Being 7 o'clock, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Baspas. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Commissioner Collins. Here. Commissioner Gary. Here. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Talentino. Here. Commissioner Torty. Commissioner Torty did call, and she is sick tonight. So, uh, Commissioner Miller. I would like to make a move that we uh, excuse Commissioner Torty because of her sickness. Support. It's been the support. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Aye. same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Today is a, um, a federal holiday. Because of that, if we could have a, a moment of silence in memory of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for his dedication and contributions in advancing social justice and equality for all. Thank you. I would ask those with uh, cell phones if you would please put them on uh, vibrate or silence them by turning them off. We, we would appreciate it. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is the 2018 uh, Police Department Awards. We could have uh, Chief uh, John Riley. Evening. Evening, John. I'd like to thank the commission for give us, giving us the opportunity to present our annual awards this year for 2017. Uh, this year we have two civilians in uh, our auxiliary unit and several officers receiving commendations. <clears throat> we'll start right off. I'd like to call to the podium Matthew Razier, Tyler Ross. Unfortunately, Tyler Ross could not be with us this evening. <clears throat> Let's see what I'm reading. On July 18, 2017, an employee of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the Lock facility crashed the car he was driving. Subject was found slumped over the wheel. Corps employees Matthew uh, Leisure. And Tyler Ross, seeing the incident, ran to the assistance and found that the driver was unresponsive and not breathing. After removing the patient from the cart, Matthew began performing CPR while Tyler retrieved an automatic defibrillator device from a close-by building. <clears throat> the leads from the device were attached to the patient and an electro electrical charge was applied. The patient's heart restarted and he reg regained consciousness shortly thereafter and was able to speak to his co-workers before being transported to the hospital. Your actions directly relate to the saving of another human being. Utilizing your training and quick response, you and your co-worker were able to bring back the pulse of a person who had none. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, I am honored to present to you the department's civilian citation for life saving. Next, I'd like to call up Sergeant Dennis Sparks from the Sioux Police Auxiliary Unit. <clears throat> For over 60 years, the Sioux Ste. Marie Police Auxiliary Unit has contributed, contributed their time to assist the full-time law enforcement department and the city in various functions. These individuals have provided traffic and crowd control during numerous parades and special events throughout the year, provided federally mandated security at the city's port facilities, assisted the department in securing some large crime scenes, provided security to some businesses during special events, 
and volunteered their time for charitable fundraiser events. The assistance to the assistance to the police department by these individuals is invaluable. It, all, it allows officers to focus on law enforcement tasks at hand in any given situation, knowing that the support responsibilities are being taken care of. <clears throat> While the duties of the auxiliary personnel are vital to the operation of the, part of the department, too often those supplying support services are not recognized for the efforts they put in. However, you should know that the work you do for the department and the city is vital to our success as a team. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, I'm proud to present to the Sault Ste. Marie Police Auxiliary Unit the department's civilian citation accommodation for your past and continued support of the law enforcement efforts provided to this community. Congratulations. Next, I'd like to call up Officer Dar Daryl Myatt. <clears throat> that good? On May 4th, 2017, the Sault Ste. Marie police officers responded to the 200 block of Leroy on the report of an unresponsive 51-year-old male. The subject was found on the couch, not breathing, and with no pulse. The patient was carried to the ambulance by Officer Mayette and, and a Sioux fire paramedic. Once outside the ambulance, Officer Mayette, <clears throat> I'm sorry, once inside the ambulance, Officer Mayette be began to perform CPR on the patient and continued until arriving at the hospital where emergency room staff stated the patient had a pulse. Your actions directly relate to the saving of another human being. Utilizing your training and determination you and other emergency personnel were able to bring back the pulse of a person who had none. Your dedication to this community speaks highly of your professionalism and is an asset to this department. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, I'm honored to present to you <coughs> the department's life-saving commendation. Before I call the next officers up, I'd like to do something new uh, we haven't done in, in, for the awards in the past. <clears throat> As you know, the department recently uh, took possession of body cameras for all of its officers. Uh, we have been using them. They are uh, in full impl implementation right now. And in this incident, uh, the officers had body cameras on. I'd like to show a clip of the incident that I'm going to be referring to. And Bonnie, if you're ready. Uh, at the mayor's request, you're going to see police officers doing their job. This isn't television. Um, I, I forget, I don't know what the phrase is for the president's salty language. There's no salty language in this, uh, but you are going to see uh, officers in action uh, at, a, at an excitable scene. Okay. Right. This is a house fire. There's two people trapped in the basement. Can you hear us? Okay, okay. Let me just bust this. The noise you hear, they're taking a baton trying to break glass block windows in the basement. Those are hard to break. Watch your eyes, bro. You guys got it. Go to the neighbor, get an axe or something. We need an axe or a shovel or something heavy. Come over here! Come towards my voice! Watch your eyes! Can, can you get out? Uh, uh, back up! Back up! Back up! For a second. Back, up. Back, up for a second. back up! Back up for a second! Hold your breath! Listen to me, back up! Alright, come out! Give me your hand! Okay. 
You heard an explosion in the background, mm -hmm. and I'll explain what that is. I'd like to call up Officer Shane Hill and Officer Marcel Coulard. Come on forward so you're in the camera. <clears throat> During the early morning hours of October 15, 2017, officers were dispatched to a house fire on the 1000 block of Young Street. Officers arrived to find heavy smoke and flames coming from the structure. Officers quickly learned from the homeowner, homeowner that there were two people still trapped in the basement. <clears throat> the only stairway leading to the basement was fully involved in flames and was inaccessible. The back door to the residence was checked and was found also to be engulfed in flames. Officers Shane Hill and Marcel Coulard lo located a glass block window which led directly to the basement. After repeated unsuccessful attempts to break the glass block, with their duty batons, a door ram was retrieved from a patrol car. The black window was removed and the officers heard the voices of the people inside. The officers called for the people to come to their voices while they successfully removed them. Unknown to the officers, there was a large welding gas tank on the enclosed back porch approximately 20 feet away from where the officers were working. Shortly after the individuals were removed through the basement window and they started making their way to the street, the tank exploded, throwing debris in all directions. Your compassion for the life of other human beings, even while your own safety was at risk, speaks highly of your dedication to duty and your community. Your actions represent the best of the police service provided by this department. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, I am honored to present to you the department's life-saving commendation. officers around just yet because they're going to be joined by their partner. Okay. I'd like to call up Officer Jake Nicholson. We're going to award a commendation that uh, since I've been here has never been awarded by the department. It's called a unit commendation. <clears throat> Dur during the early morning hours, and this is also in reference to this house fire, <clears throat> early morning hours of October 15, 2017, officers were dispatched to a house fire in the 1000 block of Young Street. Officers arrived to find the heavy smoke and flames coming from the structure. Officers quickly learned from the homeowner that there were two people trapped inside. The only stairway leading to the basement was fully involved in flames and was inaccessible. While crowds had started to gather outside the home, the responding officers quickly attempted to locate another way into the house. The only other egress was a uh, back door, which was also found to be engulfed in flames. Officer Shane Hill, Officer Jake Nicholson, Officer Marcel Coulard, working as a single unit, were able to safely remove the occupants of the house while maintaining a safe and secure perimeter and assisted the fire department throughout the incident, each working toward the combined resolution. Police officers face many challenges throughout their careers. Many times they find themselves having to resolve situations on their own. It is during incidents such as this when individual officers combine their experience relying on each other to face the unknown on behalf of the community. Your ability to use your individual strength to draw together as one in order to save human lives and maintain a safe work environment shows the cohesion of the members of this department. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, I'm honored to present to you the department's unit commendation. Jane, congratulations.
For our last award for the evening, I'd like to call up Captain John Eric Larson. <clears throat> Accepting a promotion within any police department, John does not know this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> Accepting a promotion with any police department brings with it not only higher rank and authority, but also a substantial increase in responsibilities. Many of these have never been addressed by the individual in past positions and are learned after filling the vacancy. The progression from rank and file to administration can be particularly difficult. Not only does a new administrator maintain his or her operations duties, he or she must now fulfill the task of support for the department to ensure that all facets of the agency run smoothly. The rank of captain of the department is especially challenging as that individual is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the agency as well as seeing that the direction of the department is carried out. On July 1, 2016, Officer John Larson was promoted to the rank of captain with the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, bringing with him the knowledge and experience gathered from patrol, drug force, drug task force member and drug task force supervisor, Captain Larson was fully prepared for what lay ahead of him. However, with less than six months in his new position and still learning his new administrative duties, Captain Larson was, was put in the position of being the head of the department for several months. Accepting this challenge without complaint, Captain Larson saw that the day-to-day -day operations needs were met while observing, while overseeing the management of the entire department. Returning to, do, to only his captain's duties, Captain Larson was tasked with the implementation of several new technological advancements for the department. These included, but were not limited to, the installation, operation, and training of new car and body cameras and in-car computers and their applications. A police chief must <coughs> be able to rely upon the second-in-command uh, officer to carry out the set objectives of the administration, especially during a chief's absence. Captain Larson successfully handled these tasks. On behalf of the Sault Ste. Marie Pol Police Department and with my personal gratitude, I am proud to present to Captain John Eric Larson the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department's individual commendation for professionalism and continued dedication to this department. Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for your time and allowing us to uh, do our awards. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, certainly on behalf of the City Commission, the citizens of Sault Ste. Marie, we continue to be impressed with the uh, activities and the uh, demeanor of our police department, and we have always appreciated the work that, that they have done in the community, and we are just so thankful that, that they are here. And congratulations to all of them, but to all the officers that are on duty uh, every day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll just take a couple of uh, minutes and those folks that like to leave, uh, we know you have a lot of, uh, <laughs> you're very busy people, so. Thank you, ahead. Your Honor, I'll see you. Okay, we'll call the, uh, we're going to call the meeting back to order. Thanks. Hey, Ro Roger. <laughs> we're ready to go. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Rod. He thinks he's, he thinks he's down the fish lab talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, next, uh, next up, item number two, a presentation by the I-500. 
Uh, and with us tonight, uh, Dave Thomas, uh, one of the board members, has been there a long time, gives of, the, of himself to the community. David. Hi, thank you. Uh, I want to just take a minute to uh, thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. Uh, things are, are progressing extremely well for us uh, this year, uh, much better than they have in the most recent couple of years. Um, uh, I want to just tell you about our, our key sponsors this year. Uh, of course, Myers Store has, has come in and, and uh, ha has become a, a top tier key sponsor for us. And again, we appreciate uh, Woody's Traction Products, Quaden Casinos, uh, Choco Clothing, and Sovereign Communications also has, has stepped up this year and, and is, uh, is helping, us, helping us out dramatically. Um, we obviously could not get any of this done without the local support that we get not only through um, sponsorship dollars and donations, but uh, the work that, that you guys do and, and, and the work of our volunteers. Abby's always on me about making sure that we expand the, 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 uh, our, our, not only our, our sponsorship uh, abilities, but also with regards to you know, getting the snowmobiles downtown, and, and which is really important in making sure that we can, we can uh, show the people that come to Sault Ste. Marie what Sault Ste. Marie is really about. Um, we've had a significant amount of help from, the, from Sioux High this year. Uh, the Sioux High Building Trades uh, Group uh, has been up there uh, probably about four or five weeks helping us with the new building. Uh, the Sioux High Wrestlers will be back again this year. Uh, we utilize those guys to put all the bales out on the track and to take them all down. Okay. Mm -hmm. And their coach is very pleased to, to lend them to us. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting a lot of work done, and uh, things are moving along really well. It's been great weather. We understand it's going to be the, the number five zero this year. This is our 50th race in 49 years. Yes, <laughs> yeah. as my wife pointed out yesterday. <laughs> it's only 49 years. Yes, but it's the 50th race. Yes. So uh, yeah, we could we could race today if if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You know, we've Not had enough cold weather. That's for sure. Cold weather and the warm up really helped. Yes. Okay. Um, the, when, when it's so bitterly cold that the, the ice uh, freezes really quickly. And I'm sure, as, as some of you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very brittle. And then a, a couple of days above 30 degrees, it, it loosens up, it, and then we get more cold weather and it just freezes into, instead of about 5,000 little sheets of ice, it's one big block now. So it's nice, are, are and, they're, we, and they're gonna continue to water. Are we able to uh, get the governor up here this year? I do not think the governor's gonna be here this year, uh, but I'm sure we'll have many of our, uh, of our other legislators. Uh, I, I believe uh, um, Rick knows, he, Rick's got the list of who's coming, but. Okay, well normally uh, we, I'm sure we've got a pretty good entourage, so we would yep. expect that with the 50th anniversary they'll be here. Um, certainly, and you've talked about the volunteers, and we continue to talk about the volunteers too, because that race couldn't happen uh, without them, and uh, you certainly are one of those people, but uh, tremendous amount of volunteers, tremendous amount of, uh, of goodwill uh, during sure. the week. We always talk about the $2 million roughly uh, impact a year, and we're looking at 50 years, that's $100 million uh, over that 50 year period, and that's just a, a, an estimate at this point, it's probably For sure. uh, bigger than that. So. Uh, that um, economic study was actually done by Lake State for us, and uh, I've been talking with Dr. Mitchell here, and uh, he has not been to a race yet, and is definitely he's looking ready. forward to attending <laughs> his first one, and he's and he's here in time for a really good one. That's for sure. Great. Well, good luck, and um, we certainly will see you this Saturday. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay. Item uh, item number three. Public comment on scheduled agenda items. Uh, any person may reserve time to speak on an agenda item, not to exceed three minutes per person. Is there anyone in the audience like to speak on an agenda item? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to item number four, uh, the consent agenda, a deputy city manager. Under the consent agenda, a minute approval. One, approval of the minutes of the regular city commission meeting of July 2nd, 2018. Recommended action is to approve the minutes of the regular city commission meeting of January 2nd, 2018. Item two, acceptance of the minutes of the following boards and commissions. A, Airport Advisory Board of December 14th. B, Downtown Development Authority of December 13th. And C, Economic Development Corporation of December 12th. 
recommended action is to accept the minutes of the various boards and commissions. Item B, appointments and resignations. One, reappointment to the Downtown Development Authority. Recommended action is to reappoint Scott Parker and Michelle LaJoy to the Downtown Development Authority for a term to expire April 1, 2021. Item two, appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Recommended action is to appoint Eric Welch to the Zoning Board of Appeals to fill the balance of a term to expire June 1, 2019. Item C, communications, is from the International 500 Project Incorporated. Authorization to sell liquor on city-owned property for the I-500 snowmobile race on Thursday, February 1, 2018, and Saturday, February 3, 2018, for the 50th annual I-500 race, subject to the rules of the Michigan Liquor Control Commission and any rules established by the city manager. Item D, city manager's report. One, approval of the City of Sault Ste. Marie personnel policy handbook. Recommended action is to approve the City of Sault Ste. Marie personnel policy handbook as amended. Item two, approval of an ambulance transfer agreement with War Memorial Hospital. Recommended action is to approve the proposed transfer agreement between the city and War Memorial Hospital. Item three, acceptance of grant funds from the Walmart Community Grant. Recommended action is to accept the grant funds as applied for by the fire department. Item four under city manager's report is authorization to submit an application to the assistance for, to firefighters grant program Recommended action is to authorize an application to the assistance to firefighters grant for the purchase of an exhaust system as described. Item five, approval of a resolution for waiver of penalty and interest for untimely filed property, tax, property transfer affidavits. Recommended action is to adopt the included resolution. Okay, thank you. Is there a commissioner that would something further explained on the consent agenda? Okay, hearing no, none. Commissioner Miller. Nothing more explained, but I think when she first started talking, she said July 2018 instead of January. In the very beginning oh, of that. Oh, okay. It, you mean, yeah, meant January. Maybe I was sure. thinking July. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that in case, it was, in case it was something legal, you had to do that. Feels, feels like July. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was July. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Talentino. So move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item 5, Special Orders of Business. A, second reading of the Fire Prevention and Control Ordinance. Okay, thank you. Uh, City Manager Turner? Thank you, Mayor. On this matter, I've requested that Fire Chief Labonte address the City Commission and community. Okay. Good evening, Scott. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, tonight, this evening, marks uh, the second reading of the uh, Fire Prevention and Court and Control Ordinance. It would be the, the second and last reading. As you know uh, from the from uh, the last meeting, um, a number of um, I guess you could call it deficiencies were found in the prior ordinance uh, requiring some work. The biggest was uh, an update of the fire prevention code, uh, basically uh, updating it to the international fire code, which uh, makes the, the biggest impact on the entire code, um, that which um, sets up the, the, the most amount of language for the, the code changes. Uh, in the past two weeks, we've had no submissions uh, for any questions or, or any comments uh, in, the, in that time period. So nothing from the public, no public comment on that. So. Okay. Any commissioner have any comments? We need a motion. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Collins. Is this the city manager's recommendation? Yeah, that would work. All right. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the city manager's recommendation. Support. Uh, it's been moved and supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item 6, Communications A, is from Commissioner Baker. Discussion on snowmobile routes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Baker? Yeah, I just wanted to see if we could start the discussion. Um, if you've seen the map for the snowmobile trails 
it's very deceiving, especially for people that are from out of town that aren't familiar with our area or the fact that there are certain streets that they can ride on downtown. Um, as the map defines it, the starting and end points are essentially at Osborne Alley and then down by the Antlers, but there's no connection from there to Osborne on the map visible that out-of-towners can understand that they can get there. There's just not an actual snowmobile trail done by uh, the Snowmobile Association. So um, with recent talks with certain business owners um, as well as snowmobile riders that are very confused, I, I feel like there's gotta be some sort of compromise of how we can make it work to visibly show it on the map, whether we take them right down Portage to the Farmer's Market or we take them down by the Valley Camp and down Water Street and up on Osborne would fulfill that, um, that loop and make much more sense. And uh, uh, um, you can definitely tell the impact since it's changed into, since 2008 that they changed the, the routes. Seven. Yeah, um, we get a lot so. less uh, business downtown from them mm -hmm. because I, a lot of people are confused as to how to get from one spot to the other versus going all the way back around the trail that they just rode. Mm -hmm. So uh, especially with the I-500 coming up, I think we need to be welcoming to the, uh, the, the tourists and the snowmobilers and along with our locals as well um, to try to accommodate that and just make it, it, it's not that they can't get there, they can, they just, it's not very visible on the map um, and to get a defined route through the city to give to the Snowmobile Association to put it on the map, I think would be uh, very beneficial for our downtown businesses and for our, our, our tourists. Those are um, excellent comments and I know when they established it a while back, I think it was seven or eight years ago, um, the state trunk line being East Spruce, um, we were not allowed to, um, uh, the state would not allow uh, snowmobiles to be on the uh, side of the roadway that uh, the city can control with city streets. So um, that may have changed since then, so it's, it's a good idea to bring it up, but um, I think it's a good idea also that we review just what the rules are for snow machines on city streets because it's, it is uh, uh, busy. Uh, we, it's been a number of years since we've um, looked into this and, and made it public again, and I, knew that, I know they used to be at the restaurants as people were coming in and looking for trail information. Uh, the rules uh, uh, for snowmobiles in the city of Sault Ste. Marie were on the, uh, on the information that they were passing out. So um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, hopefully we can get to that point because uh, going over the East Portage Bridge would be a, be a nice um, way to get down to uh, the downtown area. So um, I want to go to the city manager, but I'll, I'll come back to you, sure. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, even if we can do it for the prime snowmobile months, even sure. through January yes. and February, mm -hmm. or even if we do a trial run during the I-500 mm -hmm. week of some sort, to um, I, I, I think it's it's, it's certainly worth be the a discussion. You know, so city manager, well, we'll come back to you. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, as has been requested, just a brief review of the provisions which govern the operation of snowmobiles within public rights of way. Uh, under the ordinance, there are six provisions. The first, the operation is restricted to only the far right hand portion of the authorized right of way, which has been plowed. The second is that operation is prohibited on any unplowed portion of the right of way. The third being the operator shall cause the snowmobile to come to a complete stop in each and every intersection. Fourth being the operator shall hand signal all turns and stops. The fifth, that the operator shall not pass any vehicle which is moving ahead. And sixth, that the operator shall not tow any passengers with the snowmobile unless the passengers are contained in a commercially manufactured trailer designed for that purpose. Uh, just a little bit of background that these regulations appear to have been in place since 2008 and that the portion of East Portage Avenue, which is the subject of this discussion, is currently under the resolution adopted by the City Commission in 2010 uh, is an exception from the authorization to ride snowmobiles on streets. Uh, it was the pleasure of the City Commission to pursue this. Uh, the next step would be to engage in discussions with the Michigan Department of Transportation in regards to snowmobiles moving down East Portage. Okay, uh, Commissioner Miller. I understood everything that the City Manager said, but is there like an official map, map right now that yeah. we can look at? Is there, who puts that out? The Snowmobile Association. Oh, the Snowmobile puts? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. I, I think that we should maybe begin discussion with uh, the timeline of when we think it would be what we could get approved by the state of Michigan. I think it might be uh, something that maybe the city manager talked to the uh, Department of Transportation and see if they would look at a maybe a um, month or two month type thing. And then if they don't like that, then maybe we go for the month of the uh, I, you know, before the I-500 or we look at uh, the two weeks during that time to get it, just to get it started so that once it goes, maybe they would soften their um, uh, recommend, you know, the ability to go to not be on it. Maybe they would look at it, we could do it. But Commissioner Baker. And then if for any reason they won't let us do it, if we could at least get with the Snowmobile Association to map out the roads that can be ridden on, that are allowed. So they wouldn't have to go back the other mile and a half to the casino and then up and on top of the hill all and then back. And ride the trail that they yeah. already rode. And by that time. They're tired. They, yeah. Come back downtown. Makes, makes some sense that there should be roads inside the city that um, as long as they adhere to the rules mm -hmm. um, and are on their way to a trail, that was the other rule that needed to be. They couldn't just go around blocks and continue to go around the same block or two blocks. They actually had to be, if they were driving in the city or riding in the city, they had to be going to a trail, mm -hmm. as I understand it. And I think, I believe one time it was no more than 15 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember that, Don? I do. Um, and they had to stop at every intersection. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Miller. So this was adopted when? In 2008, I believe. In 2008? Mm-hmm. Do we need, can we make a motion? Sure, you can make. I'd like to make a motion that we um, talk, discuss it with MDOT and what we can do to connect the trail. I second that. Okay. Everybody understand the motion? Commissioner Collins. Um, just, just, just so I understand it, if MDOT comes back and says, no, they're not going to do it before the race, we're going to look to figure out some sort of alternative so that they can figure out how to go, like, from the um, antlers, suppose, right yes. in that area, to awesome. downtown, right? Because mm -hmm. the way, I, I don't know if anybody rides, but the way it is right now is you actually have to go back up through the I-500 underneath the tunnel that, under I-75 and then shoot across every step and like business spur and, and it's a huge chunk but i've seen snowmobiles um just even this year riding down like spruce street on you know right down the road mm -hmm. and they seem to be following the rules and i don't see any problems with it and the police officers don't seem to have a problem with it so i don't know if there's a if there's a uh instead of using the, the snowmobile trails we have right now and kind of give them a free-for-all can we set up some sort of an alternative trail system for them at least that day I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but if we can, uh, we can do to get them <laughs> to okay. get that trail connected. Let's get, uh, and I, I'd appreciate uh, people at least raising their hand before they speak so that we can keep it orderly. Thank you. Uh, let's go to our city attorney. I would, <clears throat> I would suggest due to the timing of this year's race, this is the last commission meeting prior to the race, that the motion be to amend the September 2nd, 2008 authorizing a street authorization resolution to delete Portage Avenue from Ashman Street to Sugar Island Ferry Dock and uh, subject to uh, consent of the Michigan Department of Transportation. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Miller, so move. This is something we can take care of this year. We're, we're, we're looking to take care of this this year. Well, we're going to try to. We're going to try to. Are you ma making the motion that? Uh, I'm not. I'm just asking a question. Okay. Is it something we're, uh, something we're looking forward in the future, or is this something we could take care of for this year? I think Commissioner Baker was asking if we could do something before this race, if possible. Would you like to make that motion that uh, our city attorney suggested? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion uh, that the city is, that the city attorney suggested about amending the September second, two thousand eight street uh, map for the snowmobile. Support. I second that. Okay. It's been moved supported. Are there any additional comments or questions? Does administration understand? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just to reconfirm, my understanding is that city administration uh, will approach the Michigan Department of Transportation regarding the opening of East Portage Avenue uh, for at least the I-500 event and possibly for up to one month. Mm -hmm. Also hold discussions regarding this type of amendment in the future uh, for longer term structural changes and coordinate with the Snowmobile Association about 
uh, providing information about designated routes uh, for which snowmobilers will be able to traverse city streets. Okay. City Attorney. Uh, we should probably also include uh, deleting the prohibition on West Portage Avenue from Ashman Street to Governor Osborne Boulevard. That way the connection is all the way across the border. Oh, yes. Okay, same. Understand? Yes, Mayor. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Item B under communications is from the Community Improvement Committee, appointment of ad hoc awards committee. Thank you. Uh, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As commissioners are aware, the city of Sault Ste. Marie recently accepted nominations for the WFG Bud Weber Citizenship Award and the Edna Young's Beautification Award. Nominations were accepted by the city late in 2017 and recently reviewed by the Community Improvement Committee, formerly the Blight Committee. Based on a review of the nominations, the members of the Community Improvement Committee determined that it may be appropriate for an ad hoc committee of the City Commission to be established to review the recommendations of the committee for these awards if any awards are to be issued for the 2017 calendar year. It should be noted that an award may not be issued every year. As commissioners are aware, Commissioner Twardy and Talentino currently serve as the City Commission liaisons to the Community Improvement Committee. Accordingly, if it's the City Commission's pleasure, I would suggest that they appoint an ad hoc committee to concur with the recommendations of the Community Improvement Committee for the WFG Bud Weber Citizenship Award and the Edna Young's Beautification Award and approve any recipients of awards for the 2017 calendar year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, what we were, were, what we, the manager and I have been talking about for the ad hoc committee would be uh, the mayor, the mayor is a position on there and also it could be the mayor pro tem or it could be the two members of the community improvement committee, however the commission would feel uh, they'd like to do that. Um, I, I think it would make some sense to have the two members of the that are sitting as uh, uh, ad hoc folks on those, then the committee plus the, the mayor at that point that would give us three members and would be within the uh, Open Meetings Act uh, recommendations. Is that sound okay? Mm -hmm. So as a, as a committee would be made up of the mayor and also two members from the Community Improvement Committee. Uh, is that, should that be a motion? Uh, Commissioner Collins. So would that be Commissioner Talentino and Commissioner Torty? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm cool with that. And myself. Well, is that a motion? Yes, I'd make to a motion to take the mayor's recommendation. Okay. <laughs> Support. <laughs> the move supported. Uh, are there any other discussion items? Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Both same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Item C under communications is from Lake Superior State University, Center for Freshwater Research and Education Initiative. Okay, and we are honored tonight to have with us uh, Dr. Peter Mitchell. Come on up here, Peter, to the microphone, uh, please. Um, certainly a pleasure to see you, and uh, congratulations on a, on a good weekend, uh, basketball yep. victory, and uh, finally a, a hockey victory. Indeed. So, so the, uh, the Center for Freshwater Research and uh, Education is getting closer and the staff is getting excited and we're certainly getting excited. So uh, if you'd like to go on, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. I will. I think there is a slide presentation. Oh, excellent. And as we cue that up, uh, I think it's maybe been 60 years since I might have been appearing before the City Commission and that was probably as a fifth grader wearing one of those secure <laughs> safety patrol badges and probably being recognized some way or another. And uh, so it's good to be back. Oh, it's and great to have you. I thought the Sioux had great potential then and in the last uh, six months I've discovered it has even greater potential. And uh, while we may not always win on the basketball court or on the hockey rink, I can guarantee you that uh, the Center for Freshwater Research and Education will be a winner every day mm -hmm. and will have a profound impact on this community. And I think it's most appropriate that we bring it to your attention here in the 350th year uh, as an opportunity to further strengthen this wonderful city. Um, 
So if I just push this arrow, good. Um, this has been a project that's been going on uh, over, for over 40 years. Oh, I see, yes. It's, we are so blessed <laughs> to have such intelligent faculty. Uh, Roger was really leaping forward to come and do this, but Ashley uh, was better equipped. Uh, so now you can see it's been uh, over 40 years, and uh, it has been a partnership that has, value, has been valued by the uh, uh, education community, but also by the children that come to see it and just about everybody else in between. It began uh, as a partnership among three entities, uh, the university, uh, the Michigan DNR, and at first uh, Edison Sioux, and then now more recently uh, Cloverland. And that's been a, a triad that has been very helpful. But what I'm really excited about is it's a new partnership now, um, and it's a partnership that has added the city, which I think significantly strengthens uh, the partnership. And let me take just a moment to say thank you to, to Oliver, um, to Linda, if she's still here, yes. Um, I've worked in a number of small towns and larger towns, and I can say without hesitation that this is the most co um, accommodating, supportive, collegial group of city officials that I've ever worked with. Uh, certainly your mayor is also strong, but um, you really are blessed with a very talented staff who really do look out for the best long-term interests, and it has been a joy to do that. Yes, thank you very much for all of you. Um, if you look at the future, uh, you're going to discover that it is collaboration among government entities, private partner, uh, sh uh, partnerships, uh, public uh, universities. That's what's going to determine success as we go forward, and that's at the core of what we're trying to do with Seafree. Well, there are four of us here to present tonight. Uh, we have Kevin Kapuczynski, who is an assistant professor and uh, co-director of the lab. He's kind of one of our rising stars on the faculty. We have Roger Greil, who is uh, Mr. UP, the Bessemer, uh, what do we call you, the? Yeah, the Bessemer, Speed the Speed Boys from Bessemer. He has literally, this is almost like a child to him. Um, he was going to retire because he thought they'll never get this thing done. And I said, oh, Roger, yes, we will. And once we do, you'll never want to retire. Um, and then Dr. Ashley Merkley, who is, Ashley is truly one of the most renowned scholars in this arena across the country. And so we are so fortunate to have her at Lake State. So those three will carry the program forward and then I'll kind of be the cleanup hitter at the end. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, Kevin. Good evening. Um, I'm guessing most of you are pretty familiar with the Aquatic Research Lab. Uh, in case you're not, I'm going to go over some of the accomplishments um, that those that came before me were able to make, uh, especially Roger and Ashley. Um, <clears throat> most of you are, I'm sure, aware of the Atlantic salmon fishery that exists uh, in the river and beyond. So the map that you see here with the red stars, those stars indicate where an Atlantic salmon has been recaptured, an Atlantic salmon that was reared uh, from a fertilized egg uh, at the ARL. So some of those stars just represent locations. There's been multiple salmon recaptured at, at many of those stars. So it just gives you an idea of where they uh, have gone to after being released from the lab. Uh, we estimate that this fishery locally um, contributes about uh, $9 million of economic economic activity to Michigan uh, and supports about 80 jobs. On the St. Mary's alone, uh, there's probably about eight uh, guides that are dedicated to uh, fishing for Atlantic salmon. We recently celebrated uh, 30 years of stocking Atlantic salmon. We have only been here for three years. But Roger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I will uh, do some bragging about what they have uh, been able to accomplish. So. Um, our, our students get unique learning experiences at, at the university and at the lab. It's essentially a student-run fish hatchery at the ARL. Uh, there's also a disease testing lab on campus that um, students work in, and uh, we anticipate that uh, those opportunities will um, be at Seafree as well. All of our students in the School of Biological Sciences are required to complete a senior thesis project. Uh, some of those are completed at the ARL, uh, many others are supported uh, by the ARL. And of course, we have a very strong record of employing our students at state, federal, and, and tribal agencies. 
about 75% of the Michigan DNR fish production staff are Lake State grads, and about 40% of the fisheries division staff are Lake State grads. If you think about how small we are compared to Michigan State or uh, UW Stevens Point in the region, uh, this is really an, an incredible feat. And a lot of that's because of the hands on training they get um, with Roger and with the faculty when they complete their senior thesis. So we, we try to have a strong outreach component. Um, you know, Roger is going to speak about some of the limitations we have at the current facility. Um, those limitations are, are particularly difficult when it comes to uh, conducting outreach and community engagement. Uh, despite our limitations, we, we typically reach uh, over 3,500 visitors per year. This, this past year, I think, it was over 5,000 um, based on, I think we had around, uh, over four, well over 4,000 just on the um, engineer days. Uh, and then we have uh, at least 30 uh, student groups or, or children's groups. These could be K through 12 groups come through annually. Um, we anticipate these efforts will ramp up significantly once we have the, the C free building. Uh, one thing we wanted to point out here is you know, we do have existing relationships with the city already, be, uh, one being the, the kids' fishing pond. Um, I understand there may be some uncertainty with the future of that. Um, is the, the sportsman's club dissolving? Um, so we will uh, look to somehow maintain that in the future or even uh, there is the potential to have uh, perhaps have a pond on site, but that's not in, in the design plans yet. Uh, last, I'll talk about research. Um, we brought in over $12 million in funding to the region uh, in, in freshwater research already. On, on an annual basis, we employ uh, at least 10 students. So we employ students at the Aquatic Research Lab during the academic year, also during the summer. And then we hire students on grant-funded uh, research projects. And, and they work um, all over uh, the region, but we've had them you know, working as far away as the Niagara River. Uh, and, and these research projects address uh, regional needs from water quality to invasive species to uh, native uh, sport fish uh, and, and uh, native species like lake sturgeon uh, and, um, and also fish health, uh, or I should say fish disease testing. So um, we, we have a broad reach when it, when it comes to research as well. And, They've been able to do all this despite some, some substantial limitations in the existing facility, which Roger is going to talk about. Okay. Um, they're only giving me one slide. I guess they're afraid I'm going to talk too much. Uh, I don't get out much, so maybe I ramble on too much. But with that, I would like to back up real quick and follow up with what um, Kevin had mentioned. The kids fish and pond, we're still going to be active. Cloverland's still going to be active with us on this. We're going to still set the net, we're going to still pull it, we're finding hopefully somebody else to help take it over that has a 501c. So we're still planning to work with it. Um, <clears throat> Cloverland agreed to help set the net and take it out and stuff. So that's still going to happen. Um, Kevin mentioned some of the things we have done in the past and it's just a, a small portion of what we've done. A lot of this is done with the small facility, we don't have a lot there, and what we've accomplished has been pretty amazing. Uh, not only the Atlantic Salmon Program, but we work with Lamprey and the St. Mary's River. We've worked with a number of different things throughout the years. <clears throat> and where we're at, we're grateful. We're grateful to have the opportunity to do the work there and stuff, but we do have some real limitations. Uh, secure pay, uh, space for hatchery and research. It's tough to mix the two together. It's nice to separate them out. You know, ma modern laboratories. Uh, right now it's pretty old. It's in a hydro plant. The building, our building, our hatchery has been pieced together over the years. You know, simple things like city water and sewer. That'd be pretty cool to have that. <laughs> and I could see that happening in a new building. <laughs> And That's dedicated. Roger wants the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put an out of order sign on it for a year or two after it's built. <laughs> Just for dedicated. Um, also, dedicated education space and community space. We, it's tough to offer this into a hydro plant now. We, 
We do bring groups in, but it's tough. We're in a hydro plant. It's an active hydro plant. We're limited to the area we can go within it. So um, our limitations are pretty severe, but what we've done with it has been pretty amazing. So I guess there's no question. If you've ever, if you've ever taken a tour of a fish lab and see all the stuff that's kind of piecemeal together and it actually works, and that's, I know that's Roger, and uh, all the piping, all the plastic tubing, um, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a feat that you, that's hard to explain because you really have to go through it to see how you've done it in that space that's been provided. And uh, now, how many years, it's got to be, is it 30 years? They uh, originally started in the late 70s. Late 70s, so it's but more than 30, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and to think of the impact that has happened throughout Michigan streams and, and lakes um, the and DNR, the employment uh, opportunities with DNR, I mean, it's... Yeah, they're eggs, they're, they're eggs. We have probably the only successful line of sand program at this time in the Upper Great Lakes and the Lake. Great. They're native to Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is pretty unique. We provide the DNR that goes right. If you're going to continue to talk, though, Roger, you're going to have to come back up to the mic. Oh, so yeah. people at home understand what you're saying. Yeah. What was I saying? <laughs> sure. We're not going to give you all night, though, Roger. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this, the, the program we do have, Kevin hit on it, on the locations. They're caught. They're native to Lake Ontario, so they're late, native to the Great Lakes. Lake Ontario's trying to reestablish them. They've been working with them for a number of years. We truly have the only successful Atlantic salmon program. The state of Michigan's coming around pretty good. We provide them with eggs. They've seen a pretty good return this year. So we're part of the, the DNR also providing them eggs. So we give them over 300,000 this year of Atlantic salmon eggs. And these are eggs coming back from our fish that are returning. Mm -hmm. Great. So it is unique. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think it Ashley. is, um, it's worth mentioning that, you know, I mean, when I visited, I remember when I first came here like 14 years ago and, and looked at Lake State, that you walk through that facility and it's amazing to recognize what they have accomplished over the years with that small facility. And as Roger mentioned, we've recognized the limitations for some time. In fact, it was over a decade ago that we first started, um, kind of we had our first breakthrough on truly pursuing renovating that facility. And it was in 2007 that Edison Sioux had donated the annex building, which we've talked to, to you about before. <laughs> and so that's on the west end of the hydro plant. And so we started at that point looking at avenues and able to fund um, and renovate that facility. We worked on this for many years during that time. So we acquired the land that was just south of the building in 2010. We hired an uh, architect and engineering firm, started designing all these you know, grand ideas and visioning. So we were kind of on this roller coaster. We were like right at the top where we were starting to envision what we were going to do. And then um, we had the designs complete in 2011. And I think somewhere in, across this time, I don't know, by 2014, maybe we were on at least my fourth or fifth president at this point. So we had a lot of changes in administration that kind of had slowed the progress down. And we had some changes in what priorities were at the university. And it wasn't until about actually 2014, 15 that we became the number one priority project for the state capital outlay. And so it was submitted. It was happily funded in 2016, which was a huge hurdle. And so we were really riding high that we were receiving three quarters of the cost of the, the project would be coming from state capital outlay funds, which meant we were just responsible for a quarter of that. And so now we are at the phase where um, we have recognized that there were some limitations with the annex building that made it unfeasible for us to build there. And so now we've been working with the state. We've been approved for new construction, which was another hurdle that that Dr. Mitchell overcame for Lake State. And we have begun the capital campaign and been very successful. You've probably seen in the news the last couple of weeks some, some important contributions toward Seafree. And we held community uh, visioning sessions. We had over 60 participants that came and provided input on what they would like to see at a Center for Freshwater Research and Education. And just a couple of weeks ago, we hired an architectural and engineering firm again and we're starting that design process. So that's what we really wanted to talk to you all about today is where we are with that and so you could start to see what the concepts are and the vision we have. As I mentioned, um, it's new design and so this gives us a, a, a chance to go back and think about how we can address our mission. And our mission 
is really lengthy, but I'll bo um, kind of boil it down to the idea that we're interested in providing opportunities to inform the academic, scientific, and public communities about education and research on the Great Lakes. So that means we want to continue our role and strengthen and grow in our ability to train undergraduate strong in natural resources and environmental programs, focusing on Great Lakes initiatives and issues. We want to make sure that we are a center for collaborative research, that we're bringing researchers in from universities all over the region, from agencies that are going to be working out of this area where we're within an hour's drive of three Great Lakes, and nobody else can say that truly be a collaborative center of research. And then we, we want to play a really important role to the community in terms of making sure that we can transfer the science that we do to the community, meaning that we want to provide community outreach and engagement. We want to get people involved through community workshops, through K-12 through hands-on education programs, and through just visitor opportunities to come and learn about the Great Lakes. I think one of the things, and of course I'm always biased as an aquatic scientist, but I'm always most disheartened by um, my incoming group of students that don't even know Lake Superior is the largest lake in the world. And they've grown up in this region their whole life. It's like, you know, we, we can't be good stewards of this resource out our backyard if we don't know anything about it. And so we are in a, a really fabulous place to be able to make that move. And so we are um, hoping that this new idea would be, take place, our new construction in Alford Park. And so I want to emphasize that what I'm going to present are all very much conceptual designs. We haven't actually met with the architects and engineers in any formal capacity. So don't, you know, get stuck on any of these pictures. It's just to start thinking about what we're envisioning. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is um, here, just to, to orient it, here's Portage. And so the idea is Seafree, so the Center for Freshwater Research and Education, would be constructed kind of in this project area. The hatchery that is in the east end of the hydro plant would remain, and we would renovate that um, as well. But because of these biosecurity reasons to make sure we don't have fish die offs, we'd like to keep those separate. And it's a really unique and successful facility as it is. So the building would be located somewhere in this parcel. We would like to work, and we plan on working with the city in order to create um, a tremendous improvement in terms of waterfront access for the public and connect our project with the waterfront to shore that up for I'm sure you all are aware that currently this is not accessible so this could be a really good mutually beneficial project for for the region and then we're also really interested in working with the city to obtain funds in order to make this into a community park I often refer to it as an outdoor education area because I think it's a place that could be for community gathering but I also think it could serve as a, a place where you have maybe school groups or preschool groups that are walking through the paths and there are these little education nodes where they're learning about maybe it's the tribal history of the region or maybe it's the environmental legacy we've left or maybe it's just natural history. Um, but the idea is that these would really be joint efforts to try to create a, a much um, better improved community resource in that region right now. So there are core features that we would like to incorporate, and how we do that we don't quite know yet, but that's where the architects come in. Um, but we know that we have these stories to tell, and uh, there are many stories we want to tell. We want to tell the science story, so we want when visitors come through, we want them to see that we are active researchers that are contributing to conserving and managing the resource right out here. And so that means we want to have lab spaces that are visible so when, you know, eight-year-old, you know, grade school kids come through the hallways that they see people doing science and that gets them interested in science. But we also want it to be the community members recognizing that it's important that we're doing science to, to protect our fisheries in this region. So the science story is one of those components. One of the other cores, of course, is our successful hatchery story. You've heard it. I think a lot of people in this region are familiar with the success, success of the Atlantic Salmon Program, but many people who come to visit us aren't. And so we want to make sure that uh, that sport fishing hatchery story is told, how it's been successful in training people in the agencies, but also how it's been successful in creating a recreational fishery with a lot of economic benefit. And then the last story that I'm most excited about because it's a part of our mission that we haven't been able to fulfill with our current area is this education story. We envision having kind of formalized programming rooms that we're, we're kind of tentatively calling a discovery center where pre-K through 12th grade will come in, will work, we're working with ISD already to work on establishing some of these programs where they'll come in and do hands-on curriculum that's place-based. So it's maybe learning about math, but they're using Great Lakes problems to do that. 
And so the idea is that it is, it is truly a, a kind of an outreach program to our community to engage our students at a much younger level. But we also think it'll be a, a way to op an opportunity to educate people of all ages. We would have a visitor center that would be drawing people in from within the community, but also drawing people that are coming to the community to visit this area. So it'd be a, a way to create better Great Lakes citizens, but also to build stewardship in this region. And all of that, all of that would be designed in order to really integrate with that landscape. And so again, this is just conceptual, but the idea is that we're going to be looking at ways to incorporate all those stories, the education story, the science story, the hatchery story, within a space that ties directly to the river on, on this side and then ties directly to the park on this side. So it's as if it's kind of a seamless transition, understanding why we're doing the science in order to protect this resource. And that as you walk through the building, you're experiencing all of those stories, not just one of them. So it's been a really exciting time to start thinking about this. And, and we see that there are tremendous benefits that will result to this from the community that Dr. Mitchell is going to talk about. Thank you, Ashton. Roger asked me to invite you to come down to look at the uh, fishery lab anytime you'd like. Uh, and you're always welcome, and Roger will give you a long and instru instructive <laughs> tour, but also very pleasant. Uh, I forgot to mention my appreciation for our city attorney. Steve has also been a part of this conversation. He looks so much like a city commissioner that I uh, didn't recognize him. It's been here a uh, long time. <laughs> the, uh, the benefits are to the community. Uh, to the region, obviously, and to the university. But it's going to really highlight our position in American higher education as a leader in freshwater research. Um, we've already got a good reputation. This is going to really ratchet it up. Um, we're going to be inviting uh, scholars from literally all over the world to come to our place because of the nexus of Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, uh, the Mackinac Straits, the St. Mary's. It's just such a fantastic and unique location and it uh, really draws upon the reason why Sault Ste. Marie is where it is. Um, it's also going to be a place for people to come in the community, not just necessarily about the water, but when you're right there at the water, no matter what group is using our community room, it's going to be right there at a, such a pivotal point, and of course, improving access to the waterfront. The, um, as we discussed, the Discovery Center to me is going to be almost like a museum that young people can come to throughout the summer. It will be a tourist destination. Um, we're going to increase uh, enrollment. We're no, no doubt about that. We're having a phenomenal year already, but when you've got a world-class uh, educational program and a department that's so well respected, we see that growth. They've done studies that will say a student brings in anywhere from 20 to 40,000. Um, you figure if we get 100 more students because of Seafree, which I think is a, a realistic, we're talking about two to four million dollars worth of economic uh, impact. And uh, I, I think you're going to discover that. Uh, part of the search that I'm doing for the next president, one of the emphasis in our uh, prospectus is we want to be a college town. We want to, you want to, we've never really worked at it yet and it's about time and I will tell you that the candidates that are being attracted to the presidency like that part of the prospectus. They too want to be a part of a, of a college town. And so you see the enrollment is in, improving. Obviously, that means more students downtown. That means more activity, more vibrancy in the community. And, but also, the whole concept of recreational fishery, we are as a society, because the pace is so fast, we want to try to find things that bring meaning to us. And for those who uh, look to fishing as their recreation, this is going to be a boon not only for the fishing, but also for the research on fishery and, and recreational fishery. So we have a very ambitious timetable. Um, we're going to be meeting in the next uh, uh, several weeks to finalize the plan. Uh, we chose Smith Group as our uh, architect and engineering firm because they know us so well. They've been working with us for almost a decade. And we know that we have to submit by April 1st. So we're looking at a three of the busiest months of our lives at, on campus. But we're ready and we're queued up uh, for it. 
We, we know that um, the submission is going to be um, well received. We've been working very closely with the capital outlay folks in Lansing. Uh, they're so excited about our project that they're encouraging me if we can raise a little bit more to think about even expanding it. And so that's a very positive sign. The fundraising is progressing well. We're, you heard about the announcement about the barge and you saw his name on the building. I must admit, I did show that to him and uh, Dick and Teresa at dinner one night, and uh, they looked at it and I said, and all it's going to cost you is $500,000, and Teresa, before Dick could say anything, said, we're in. And so this is really the, you know, Dick and Teresa Barch, and that's why their name is on the table. But uh, we also are going to be announcing probably within two weeks another half a million that we've raised. So we're now two-thirds of the way, uh, and we have until September to raise the remaining nine. $150,000. i am very confident that we will not only achieve, uh, achieve that goal but exceed it. Which takes us to the request of the city and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, clearly uh, we do see this as a partnership uh, among all four entities. Um, we believe that this is ideally situated in Alfred Park and so we're going to be requesting a portion. We don't know what that is until the engineer is finished, but we showed you kind of the general areas in which it will be uh, situated. Uh, we believe that it would be important to remove the outbuilding on the parcel, um, and uh, that probably not only will enhance the property, but it will create an opportunity for the park uh, that we would like to, to work together. Uh, we do think that it might be necessary to install a new road. There is Salmon Way, but there is discussions about maybe a better entry way and that road in and of itself. And then in return for these um, uh, working together with you, uh, I have personally committed to raising a half a million dollars for the waterfront restoration so that it can become that fishing area that we all desire that we as an institution will work with the city to, require, uh, to acquire the grant funding for the stabilization and the park creation. Um, one of the nice things about um, the board wanting me to continue working with uh, Lake State is that I'll be working over the next uh, up to three years on projects and this will be one of, well this will be at the top of my list, I love this project, but I'll be also working on other initiatives, economic development that could involve the region. Um, and then uh, a next would be to, to maintain the public access uh, to the property and the, and the waterfront, and we will work together on that and to collaborate with the city to create and maintain the park. And we've already made a commitment to Oliver and to Steve and Linda and others uh, that we will be your partner in maintaining that. In other words, we're not just going to say thank you and now it's all in your hands. Um, we really do believe that this is a, an effort, uh, a joint effort of collaboration between all of us. So that is the request. And I would be glad to answer any questions. And the ones I don't, I'll ask Ashley or Kevin, um, but not let Roger. Me, let no. me just thank all, all four of you for the, the presentation. Uh, it's certainly an exciting time. Uh, we've, we've known this has been on the horizon for a number of years as we negotiated, and you've negotiated with the uh, Cloverland uh, Board of Directors uh, Electric. So um, we're getting closer. And uh, it is, I think we and uh, Tom, President uh, Plager, was here. And he, yes. he mentioned it was a, a game changer. and. and Without, without a doubt, the tourism aspect and the uh, education aspect for the, uh, um, all the students in the area from you know, kindergarten to the high, through the high school. Um, it's, um, it's just a great project. Um, anyone have any questions? Uh, Comm Commissioner Baker. Um, as far as the access for the public down on the waterfront, it, does it, they will be allowed to fish? Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. for sure. sure. Oh, yeah. one other thing. Dick Barch is going to be a new trustee starting in January, and his purpose and focus will be getting this built as soon as possible. He would like it built by June. I told him that's not going to be possible. I said, would you accept September 19? He said, no later than that. So I think we'll have a, a real driving force on the board as well. Great. So thank Great. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, City Manager, you have additional comments? Uh, yes, Mayor, just uh, for the Commission's uh, awareness and as recapped in the memorandum, there are two recommendations in front of the City Commission. The first being to authorize the City Manager to execute a memorandum of understanding with LSSU to further collaborate on the Center for Freshwater Research and Education Initiative as detailed and to authorize LSSU to fundraise for detailed purposes and secondarily to authorize City Administration to work with LSSU to further advance the Center for Freshwater Research and Education Initiative and return to the City Commission during a future meeting with a proposal on necessary property disposition actions. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. In discussion with the city attorney, that can be one motion. Uh, Commissioner Gary. I would move the city manager's recommendation. I support. It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Collins. Yes. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Talentino. Yes. Mayor Bospis. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. And uh, best wishes. We know you'll. It'll happen. No. Great. Okay, we are into the city manager's report, item number seven. Thank you, Mayor. Item A under the city manager's report would provide authorization to execute an agreement with board docs for paperless governance solutions. As noted within a memorandum in April 2008, the city commission authorized a paperless agenda software platform for all city commission meetings. The software platform selected was Sire, which was purchased and supported through the current financial software Clarity. Over the past 10 years, this has been both effective and cost efficient. In July 2017, administration was informed that Clarity would no longer be supporting Sire, which would require the city tran to transition from Sire to a different agenda management software platform. Based on this information, city administration reviewed several programs to which a change could be made, including Board Docs, Civic Clerk, Nova Solutions, iCompass Tech, and OnBase. It was determined based on the research that Board Docs provided a program platform that met or exceeded the city's current needs and would provide the ability to grow and advance the agenda management system. Reference checks were conducted by Deputy City Manager Troyer, with all of those contacted determining that the program is user friendly, easy to navigate, and that the transition and implementation was smooth and customer service was outstanding. As a summary of the advancements which would be gained by implementing the new software, uh, it would be noted that the general public would have the ability to live stream city commission meetings with the agenda in view as they watch the meetings and that city administration would save approximately just under eight thousand dollars a year in administrative time and that the city administration would not have to manipulate the packet to fit on the web page as it would be available through the board docs portal eventually the various boards and committees of the city could also have their agendas and information uploaded into the city website using this platform Accordingly, it would be my recommendation that the City Commission authorize the City Manager to execute an agreement with Board Docs for a paperless governance solution as presented. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. And I, I apologize. Uh, there was an item under Communication D, which was uh, Ishan Atto was supposed to be here to talk about the airport uh, property agreement and called and said he would not be able to be here. So um, I, had, I had marked through that and just continue right on. So I do apologize. And uh, the city manager has uh, made a recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Miller, uh, we are on the recommendation that the manager is asking with the board docs. I, uh, I make a motion that we go with what the city manager said. Yeah. Support. It's been moved supported. Are there any questions? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Talentino? Yes. Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item B under the city manager's report would provide for the adoption of the 2018 to 2024 six year capital improvement plan. On this matter, I request that City Engineer Basista present to the City Commission and public. Evening, Linda. Good evening, Mayor, Commission. I'm going to close out of this. Okay, so um, for you is at your dais that I placed is a book of the 2018-2024 six-year capital improvement plan. So it's there for you to uh, with you if you so choose. If you want a paper copy, if you don't want a paper copy, because you're going to get inundated with material anyway just leave it at the dais and uh, we will pick it up and we'll reuse it and redistribute them sure already done okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is our uh, sixth year of preparing a six-year capital improvement plan and uh, it 
capital improvement plan it, program is the process of identifying and planning for large-scale public expenditures and the capital improvement plan provides for a baseline of the funding needed for major capital outlay the six-year capital improvement plan also is a planning document not it's not an appropriation of funding that's what you do uh, during the budget review uh, process is approve a budget for uh, any of the projects or expenditures proposed in the capital improvement plan but it is it is just that it is a planning document this year the, for the 2018-2024 CIP uh, has representing uh, 74 million dollars worth of projects uh, on equipment and it covers 115 of those projects and equipment and in the in the uh, plan they're broken down by the type of a project or it which is buildings infrastructure parks and vehicles and equipment and it's also broken down by department so if you want to uh, there are the spreadsheets that cover both um, organized by each of those when we prepare the capital improvement plan the department directors uh, submit their projects and and then uh, the CIP committee ranks them in each each department as they submit their project is is the department ranks their own project or equipment and then the CIP committee gathers and also ranks it as a committee as well so the ranking system used is uh, number four is a, a high number four priority is an essential project this meaning it's urgent it's a high priority project should be done if at all possible and we should make every effort to find sufficient funding for for the project number three is a desirable and it's a high priority project that should be done as funding becomes available but if funding is not available it will not immediately impact services number two is acceptable um, it's worthwhile it's been identified uh, that it's been adequately planned but it's not absolutely necessary and should be de uh, deferred if budget reductions are necessary and a priority one is deferrable low priority project which are desirable but not essential to in a if postponed not a detriment to present services so the each year uh, projects are identified in in each year of six years in year one for priority four the essential projects there are 33 of those projects or items or equipment and it covers an estimated cost of 6.2 million dollars and I'm just going to go over some of the some of those projects uh, infrastructure for example there's a airport parallel taxiway uh, reconstruction design 64,500 this second year includes the construction for that East Easter Day Road and Utility Reconstruction four million dollars but as you may recall that project was included in the Tiger Grant associated with the carbide dock repair and but if we don't get that funding the East Easter Day uh, Road and Utility Project is a high priority project it's it's essential for continuing services and so it's separated out as its own project in the CIP as a year one high priority project there's also the streets capital preventative maintenance that's an annual ongoing um, set aside of road contingency funds George Kemp Marina Dock 14th Street water booster station and water main replacement under West Portage Bridge this is not a comprehensive list of the infrastructure projects but it's a representation then uh, buildings we also have the DPW complex improvements fire hall we have two projects associated with the fire hall one is a diesel exhaust removal system and then fire hall restoration equipment this is a there's a long list of equipment so uh, this is again just an example there's water treatment plant equipment wastewater treatment plant equipment parking structure uh, parks department mowers the uh, tractors uh, motor graders 
uh, and health and safety, cardiac monitors, police and fire, portable radio replacements, and self-contained bre breathing apparatus. So you can see a capital improvement program is across the board. Uh, a capital improvement, I should say, is any expenditure uh, for equipment or a project that is over $10,000 and is not just an, um, uh, has a, is supposed to have a long life, except for in the case of equipment that, um, for example, uh, vests, bulletproof vests for the police, those are something that's in the capital improvement plan. It's a year by year uh, replacement, but it's, um, but that was, is considered a capital improvement. And then vehicles, carpool vehicles, EDC, ambulance replacement, and parks department uh, pickup trucks. So years two through six priority project, four, priority four projects, the essential projects, again, urgent, high priority. When we say urgent, um, it could be an out year project. It could be identified in year five or year six as a priority four, meaning an essential project. That is an example of a good asset good asset management planning. We've, um, we're on the, uh, we've been working on asset management plans. We have an asset management plan for our water system. We're on our way to completing one for our wastewater system. And we use the asset management um, for our road system. Tran the State Transportation Asset Management Council has required a implementation of transportation asset management plan. So those are three formal asset management plans that we have. And because of that, then we can identify on out years that we have essential projects, but they're not planned for another five or six years. So we have 35 projects in, in this year's CIP and totaling 15 million of a total 74 million of the of the book. So that's asset management is gets us to that place where we have those projects. So uh, that's a summary, a really brief summary of the capital improvement plan. And I'd like to thank Angie Patterson from my office. She's the CIP coordinator. So she assembles all the all the documents, sets up all the meetings with the, when works with the committee, and then the CIP committee, which is made up of uh, several department heads, as well as the DDA director and EDC director. Okay, thank you. Any questions of Brenda? And certainly this is uh, the sixth year, and each year it is updated, um, and as projects are completed, they fall off, and new ones are, and then they re-rank, go through and re-rank everything again. So, uh, Commissioner Collins. Yeah, I, I actually love it. I went through it a little bit, uh, but can I get a copy of it? I don't have a hard copy. Oh, I, I put them on. Yeah, you can have this. Would you okay. like to make a motion? They're here. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve. The, okay, committee approved program through 19 or through 2024. Support. Com Commissioner uh, Baker. And just so I understand, so this is just a wish list. This isn't, we're not approving any of the, No, the, 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 it's a planning document, so it can, um, it's always moving type of thing. Okay, but so we do we go off of this when it comes to budget setting? Sure. Is that how Can? it works? Mm -hmm. Yes, especially for the projects. Some of those will already be, some of these projects will be in the, the document that we get for the, the budget. The first year projects are the basis of the capital outlay that department had to submit for their departments for the upcoming 1819 budget. And at, at that time, during budget process, a more detailed look at the available funding is looked at more closely. And some, so some of these projects will come to, a majority of these projects will come to you in the proposed budget. Some of them may not because we may have already determined that we don't have the funding source for them. Okay, and the, and the city manager will ultimately make a recommendation on each one of those items. Okay, Commissioner Baker? So the ones that are priority number four, we would more than likely see coming through this year. Is that if they're priority four planned for this year, some, as I said, some of the uh, priority fours are planned for out further out years. We know that they're coming up. They, we know that it's an essential need, but it's not planned for the upcoming budget. 
Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Commissioner Miller. I have one quick question for you. <clears throat> and I apologize because I just got this before the meeting started. But I notice on page 40, it talks about the Carbide Dock shoreline, which extends into Alfred Park, continuing to erode, causing dangerous and unrepairable sinkholes. Anything that we heard tonight from the university have anything to do with that? I see it's a $17 million. Yep. Is there, am Absolutely. I looking at, I'm looking at the There's computer, a, I'm looking at this. Is, is there something? There is a will connection. It, will it change that number or? No, it won't change that number because that's the number needed to repair the, the shoreline. So nothing we and heard tonight from the university has anything to do correct, with that. Correct. They're, they're looking at doing the building. It'll be set back away from where the repairs are needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have, and then we talk about the Tiger Grant that has was submitted. The Tiger Grant does address that if we can get funding. Okay. Any, anyone else? We have a motion to support. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Talentino. Yes. Mayor Bosmus. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Collins. Yes. Commissioner Gary. Yes. Okay. That concludes the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Okay, thank you. Item number eight is the status report. And going over to the microphone at the podium is our city manager. He has his year-end report coming up. Well, thank you, Mayor and Commission. I'm very pleased to present the 2017 year-end report for the city of Sault Ste. Marie. As a, as a sidebar, I did see former City Commissioner Lynn today. He indicated that if he were here, he would recommend to accept it and place it on file. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, certainly would like to express my appreciation to Deputy Clerk Jen Nelson. Uh, we work very closely on this project together, and her uh, ability to represent the graphics really helps to bring the report to life. So as the Commission is aware, in 2017, uh, there were a lot of tremendous events which, which continued to provide entertainment for the citizens and guests, helping drive tourism and economic development. Uh, those major events which were supported with city involvement uh, ranged from the I-500 event to the Winter Festival, the opening of the locks, Engineers Weekend, uh, the Gus Macker Tournament, July 4th, Rendezvous in the Sioux, the Sioux Ultimate Paddle Day, the Great Race, the Great Lock Lakes Hog Rally, the International Bridge Walk, the International Festival of Races, and the Light Up the Sioux. Including, as part of the event portfolio, the 22nd Annual Citywide Cleanup, uh, which included 160 volunteers, 940 tons of garbage collected, and 130 people who attended the picnic at Sherman Park. Certainly a lot of the infrastructure of the event was put into place by uh, Becky Bottrell, who uh, retired from the city and certainly appreciate those past efforts and those volunteers who not only help with the citywide cleanup, but help with the other events. Uh, certainly takes a lot of volunteer time. The Downtown Development Authority also drove economic development and placemaking efforts by supporting over 30 events with the support of over 300 volunteers in 2017. Uh, just working around the graphic, there were a number of events from Ladies Night Out to the Bike to Work Day, the Memorial Day Parade, uh, the traditional Small Business Saturday in open houses, the Parade of Lights, the Sioux Film Festival, Oktoberfest, Maloney's Michigan Beer Fest, Restaurant Week, Downtown Days, uh, the repainting of the Crosswalk Art, uh, the second year that the Crosswalk Art has been uh, done for the community, the July 4th Parade, Slash and Ashman, the Sioux St. Marie <laughs> Farmer's Market, the Sioux Arts, Crafts, and Family Fun Fair, Music in the Park, and Citywide Flower Planting. Another busy year for the DDA in terms of events and activities. A few of the special events uh, that are unusual. One was the Potter's Field Blessing Ceremony, which uh, was coordinated by the Knights of Columbus with support from the Chippewa County Historical Society and the city, which improved Potter's Field on the historic Catholic side of the Riverside Cemetery. It included signage, uh, pathway, and other improvements, a seating area. And a blessing ceremony was held on September 17th in honor of the estimated 189 individuals who were buried at the site and once were a part of the community. 
The Knights of Columbus will generously maintain these improvements into the future. Also during 2017, uh, the National Police Week from May 14th to May 20th. A few of the pictures from the event. Uh, both the city and LSSU were honored to host Michigan's Upper Peninsula 2017 Peace Officers Memorial Service, honoring the fallen officers of the Upper Peninsula, the Wisconsin border and Canadian border agencies. Many law enforcement agencies contribute, contributed to the planning and holding of this important event. Moving into the community partnerships, which defined 2017, uh, the binational collaborative efforts with Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario certainly continued in full swing with both municipalities holding a joint meeting of their governing bodies, partnering on a number of economic development initiatives, and cooperating on a bid uh, to procure Amazon's second headquarters to be located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. And more partnerships with Lake Superior State University, as was presented tonight, uh, collaboratively working for the future construction of the Center for Freshwater Research and Education with a facility integrating student training, research, opportunities, and community resources. And also collaborating on the installation of bicycle lanes on Easter Day Avenue. And aside from helping to promote a sense of place, uh, the lanes have improved the safety of students and pedestrians crossing at Easter Day Avenue and helping to make Sault Ste. Marie more student friendly. Changing gears a touch, a local coalition consisting of the city, Chippewa County, the Eastern Upper Peninsula Intermediate School District, and the Chippewa County Road Commission successfully advocated in 2017 to help preserve equity, equity and taxation and protest the dark store theory and its use by Walmart, which graciously, graciously withdrew a years-long appeal of its property taxes. Local units had stood to lose over $268,000 annually, but the amicable resolution reached between the parties helped to support the continued delivery of core services. Uh, there is one other major tax appeal which remains on the docket, and throughout 2018 and 2019, uh, the coalition is continuing to protest another major appeal filed by Cascade X, which owns Cascade Crossings, but certainly the ongoing partnership of the coalition partners is instrumental in helping to advocate for equity and taxation and the services that the community has come to expect. Uh, 2017 was also a major year in regards to the city's collaboration with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, these include efforts uh, ranging from the enhancement of communication through identified points of contact to the launching of a business and partnership program and vinyl program uh, that has engaged local business community the development of a welcoming packet and a website, www.welcometothesoo.com, that can be used by the Coast Guard members and the public who transition into the community. Uh, collaboration on a number of events, which included the U.S. Coast Guard Day, the Coast Guard Open House activities during Engineers Weekend, and the annual Coast Guard Scavenger Hunt, as well as a New Year's Eve event at Kane's Rink. Uh, certainly, we are looking forward to continuing these efforts in 2018, and the core partners uh, include the Coast Guard, the City, Sioux Events, the CVB, DDA, LSSU, the Sioux Area Public Schools, the Chamber of Commerce, and the EDC, and anybody with an interest in this uh, effort, certainly welcome to reach out to the city. Uh, as far as the partnerships with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, those also continued in full swing in 2017 from the uh, just awarded $20,000 in funding from the Handshake Partnership Program to help construct handicap accessible picnic shelter, parking spaces, and curbing in Brady Park, uh, to the cooperation with the Army Corps uh, that's necessary to hold music in the park and the 4th of July fireworks, and also the collaboration with the Sioux Locks Visitor Center Association to help support volunteers who are stationed at the Sioux Locks and help to promote the community and also reside at Ani Osborne Campground. And uh, significant work in 2017 also went into the evaluation of the International Bridge Bus by the International Bridge Administration, the City of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and the Community Action Agency, uh, as well as UPTA, the Chamber, the DDA, 
and the Convention and Visitors Bureau to take a look at the bridge bus to work to maximize its service delivery to the Twin Sioux, uh, to expand awareness, marketing, and promotion of the asset, and to modernize technologies while boosting ridership and trying to maximize the value of the investments in the bridge bus service. Extensive collaborations were also forged throughout 2017 uh, with the support of the city, Sioux Historic Sites, the famous Sioux Lux Cruises, the U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, MCM Marine, the Police Auxiliary, cruise ship companies, and Roan Salvage Company to prepare a site near the Valley Camp to receive cruise ships. Uh, this was a very significant project from 2017, required collaboration across a number of departments and across a number of governmental entities, and it resulted in the continuation of cruise ship dockings in a community uh, with a projected attainment of over $1 million in estimated positive economic impacts to the local business community over the next five to seven years. Certainly the, uh, the new site we think helps showcase the community and, uh, and its place making elements more effectively than the carbide dock was able to. And uh, certainly looking forward to further collaborations with the cruise ship companies in the future. 2017, much like 2016, was a year of significant community driven initiatives. As the commission is aware, a number of impressive enhancements uh, were made by Mr. Denny Doherty and the Island Trail and Project Park Committees during 2017 uh, with the support of city administration, including the installation of three boardwalk systems on Voyager Island, the installation of a pre-approved stationary ramp on Rotary Island Park, the installation of an ADA compliant transfer bench at Harvey Marina, and the completion of the Sioux Field Trail um, with the support of various parties. Uh, similarly, much like 2016 and 2017, the Building Healthier Communities Coalition uh, was very vital as far as volunteerism, promotion, and providing partnership and community health grant funding uh, with support of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians on a number of projects ranging from the improvements at Voyager Island Park to improvements at the Lynn Trail System, the crosswalk paintings, uh, the UP4 Health Community Challenge, the painting of a downtown art discovery pathway, the updating of the garden area around the farmer's market, the installation of bicycle repair stations, and the Power Canal Trail project. Uh, changing gears to um, bicycle friendly improvements, 2017 was certainly a very busy year in that regard with extensive citizen interest in those types of improvements being supported by Bike Friendly Sioux. Uh, local bicycling enthusiasts, and many other individuals, with progress including closer coordination between bicycle uh, enthusiasts and the city government in transportation planning, closer coordination uh, with law enforcement with the Sault Ste. Marie Police Department, designating an officer to attend a bicycle safety course, and uh, engaging with our lo local bicycling community, uh, expanding collaboration on initiatives that help to support bicycling, and helping to foster a dialogue uh, with a number of governmental partners which can really help to drive a regional appeal uh, to bicycling and interconnectivity. Uh, the uh, primary stakeholders and user groups of the Malcolm Park ball fields have also taken a lot of initiative in 2017 forming the Malcolm Pride Committee. Uh, the city has been working closely with this committee to evaluate facility needs, expand seasonal maintenance of the ball fields, and foster improved understandings of the future capital infrastructure improvements at the ball field facilities to help drive economic development. Uh, we expect this collaboration to continue throughout 2018 as well. And of course, the efforts from the um, crowdfunding effort on the Power Canal Trail with the city, Cloverland Electric, and the Michigan Department of Transportation, and over 100 amazing donors stepping forward throughout 2017 and early in 2018 to help crowdfund over $70,000 through patronicity in order to receive the $50,000 from the MEDC uh, to support project enhancements. Certainly that amount that was raised exceeded our initial expectations and, and hopes to raise $50,000 locally and really think it helps speak to the community interest in these types of recreational improvements. As far as the very large and diverse group of volunteers and stakeholders which are continuing to support the Downtown Development Authority, uh, 2017 was a significant year for Michigan Main Street 
which completed its first year uh, in implementation with the Main Street program helping to train 33 individuals and for the first committee meetings to be held in support of the Main Street initiative. In regards to economic development, there are also a number of companies that um, made major investments in the community, uh, ranging from north of Chicago Pizza, uh, Gitchagumi Fudge, the Sioux Boutique, Great Lakes Environmental, 727 Salon, Oak Crepe, Baker's Dozen, the UP Auto Group, O'Reilly Auto Parts, Family Dollar, Superior Aqua Systems, Superior Industrial Services, the Hampton Inn, Alpine Chocolate House, the Pop-Up Shop, Stringing Things, Forget-Me-Not Furniture, Austin's Cigar Bar, Cultured Pop, Meyer War Memorial Hospital, Fast Care, and Huntington, Superior Insurance, Mansfield Insurance, Capstone Leadership, Wicked Sister, and DES Mako. And information from the Small Business Development Center indicates that locally there were 25 business starts, 83 jobs created, 47 jobs retained, and over $4.7 million in capital formation. Uh, just to touch on additional efforts of the DDA in regards to economic development, uh, there are four properties at the end of 2017 and beginning of 2018 for which uh, the MEDC has committed to 50% funding for the improvement of their facades, generating a total investment of over $850,000. Uh, DDA has also been successful in obtaining a number of mini grants with the support of the Building Healthier Communities Coalition and the Partnerships and Community Health Program uh, with the support of the Sioux Tribe, including $2,500 for Art and Prospect Alley, $13,500 for the replacement of the farmer's market canopy, $6,000 to support an extra pedestrian kiosk which was relocated, and $7,000 for two bicycle repair stations in the downtown. Uh, additional support was obtained from the Eastern Upper Peninsula Regional Planning and Development Corporation in the amount of $2,000 for a seating area that will be installed in the Huntington Bank green space, and $40,000 obtained uh, from the State Historic Preservation Office for the creation of a historic district which will help to provide additional incentives for development in the future. Uh, progress, was, progress was also made to help support the creation of new murals on the Sioux Realism Building and the Fowler Building. Uh, Sioux St. Marie Economic Development Corporation also had a very busy year uh, working to revitalize the local Brownfield Redevelopment Authority authorizing the Brownfield Redevelopment Funds through the authority to help to support the demolition of condemned properties at 606 Eureka and 629 Magazine Streets. Uh, working closely with the EUP Board of Realtors to further market available properties, uh, helping support the completion of a transportation logistics study, reestablishing the local manufacturers alliance, conducting outreach through Sky Magazine, and hosting a wide variety of events geared towards economic development. The EDC also had a very busy year uh, managing Sanderson Field uh, with major improvements including the completion of the PFC overlay and runway improvement project, crack ceiling maintenance, and planning for the future design and reconstruction of the parallel taxiway which like the PFC overlay project would be funded at a 90% grant issued by the state of Michigan. Uh, the Economic Resources Alliance, which includes a number of core partners listed at the bottom of the slide, certainly supported a number of initiatives throughout 2017, including the use of the concierge program to provide 10 asset tours, coordinating a business after five event with Hampton Inn and 1668 Winery, creating a frequently asked question sheet about the health department processes, supporting the construction summit and planning for a second summit in 2018, identifying key properties for marketing and development assistance, and engaging with business owners and entrepreneurs to offer assistance. During 2017, the city and EDC were again also awarded the E-City's five-star best practices award for excellence in economic development and placemaking. As a result, the city is one of a, a core small numbers of communities to receive this award four times uh, during the existence of the program. Switching gears to construction projects, uh, the engineering department administered 10 construction projects in 2017, ranging from the CSO control phase C3, 
which helped to close out the city's 25-year combined sewer overflow control program, the East Spruce Street Reconstruction Project, the West 4th Avenue Reconstruction Project, the West Easter Day Pedestrian and Bicycle Improvement Project, the Soccer Field Trail Improvement Project, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, Emerald Ash Borer's Reforestation Tree Plantings Initiative, the installation of mooring dolphins in support of the cruise ships, uh, the Cloverland Right-of-Way Clearing Stump Removal Initiative, annual pavement markings and sidewalk repairs. Significant progress from engineering also included coordinating with the Michigan Department of Transportation on the future reconstruction of the I-75 business spur, uh, the groundwork necessary to prepare for the Power Canal non-motorized trail project, securing over $928,000 in grant funding for capital infrastructure improvement projects, submitting the Tiger Grant application in the amount of $19,500,000, and completing significant work on the city's $1.5 million grant-funded stormwater and wastewater asset management program. Uh, this was a very significant project on a day-to-day -day basis and included field mapping, manhole inspections, televising, and inventory and condition assessments. In addition, the engineering department personnel attended safe routes to school training with employees from the Sioux Area Public Schools, and after this training learned that the school system has received a grant for planning assistance to be conducted by Michigan State University. Uh, the infrastructure improvements that would be effectuated through this grant would be uh, studied in 2018 with possible implementation in 2019. As far as departmental stewardship, uh, the Department of Public Works significantly advanced conditions at the water treatment plant by painting all railings, the main stairway, and the second floor hallway, creating an asset management plan for submission to the DEQ, installing a new inline chlorine analyzer, and successfully completing the laboratory recertification process while re rebuilding the fluoride feed system. At the wastewater treatment plant, also a number of improvements providing for the installation of a new common neuter for the Park Place lift station, uh, working on the renewal of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, which was required for the operation of the plant, uh, rebuilding shafts and replacing bearings, providing for the installation of a new secondary bypass meter, uh, again, working closely with our consultant on the SAW grant funded asset management plan and planning for future extensive improvements to the facility. Moving into the utility distribution system, a significant amount of work, again, completed on the SAW grant, uh, installing and monitoring flow meters, repairing 18 water main breaks, and completing numerous improvements during construction projects on utilities for the betterment of our utility customers. Uh, Street Department also had a significant year, significantly expanding the amount of spray patcher emulsion that was used using over two times of the amount in 2017 that was used in 2016 to help maintain major and local streets, while also performing two significant drainage and road improvement projects, uh, continuing the signage replacement program, expanding snow removal in the downtown area, achieving better coordination with the contracted sidewalk uh, clearing contractor, and implementing new software for the tracking of the city's rolling fleet for maintenance and asset management purposes. Uh, changing to Parks and Recreation, 2017 included the donor-funded installation of the new scoreboard at the Polar, significant coordination on cruise ship dockings, the procurement of a $32,500 waterways grant for repairs at the George Kent Marina, uh, coordination on the installation of a new pit toilet and vault system at the Ashman Bay boat launch area, the installation of two new brine pump and motors and electrical upgrades at the Polar, the addition of wood fiber materials for playgrounds, Sherman Park Project Playground in St. Mary's. And just a note, would like to express our appreciation to the Rotary Club for their partnership on those programs. And ongoing improvements to improve the Manny Boucher Room at the Polar with funding support coming from the Boucher family and the Sioux Tribe. In regards to advancements in public safety and community service, uh, during 2017, the police department implemented new employee recruitment and hiring practices, which helped the department achieve full staffing despite ongoing staffing shortages in the profession across the state and country, implementing new car and body cameras, 
coordinating the installation of new LED lights with the payback and project cost of 1.8 years, continuing to utilize the 55-gallon drum pill incinerator procured with the partnership of Families Against Narcotics, partnering with the Michigan State Police on an ANGEL program, and significant research uh, in regard to the ordinance which was adopted by the City Commission on RVs, trailers, and items parked within the right-of-way. Fire Department, similarly, uh, a large year for the Fire Department in working to procure a new ambulance for ongoing operations, procuring six pieces of self-contained breathing apparatus, raising over $3,500 through the annual Battle of the Badges, and $3,800 from a boot drive for disaster and hurricane relief, uh, collaborating with our governmental partners on local trainings, working toward the installation of a new boiler and equipment in the basement of the fire department, and completing over 229 fire alarms and over 2,900 ambulance service calls. On the administrative end, uh, on the uh, clerk's office, community development, finance, assessing, and information technology departments, projects ranged from efforts to comprehensively review the city's code of ordinances for modernization, uh, making informational techn technological capacity improvements on pumping stations and water towers, investigating a new VoIP phone system, uh, becoming formally engaged in the Redevelopment Ready Communities program, and progress made to develop the master plan and select a consultant for the development of a form-based code, as well as progress made to continue code enforcement activities which the Community Improvement Committee recognizes that when code enforcement activities are thoughtfully administered, can help to promote economic development and reinvestment. <clears throat> Administration also worked with the new selection of Anderson Tackman and Company as the city's auditor, at renegotiating the rates for interest earnings on deposits, procuring and financing a new GAP VAX truck, and streamlining cash receding processes, increasing efficiencies. And finally, these offices work to adopt a revised capital infrastructure special assessment interest rate policy, uh, complete various staff training and succession planning activities, inspect over 900 properties and implement new standards from the State of Michigan Tax Commission, and make management improvements to the dial ride system in conjunction with the Community Action Agency. Uh, also a major year for legislative priorities, the City of Sault Ste. Marie, as the Commission is aware, encountered significant legislative and public policy matters, ranging from the voicing of support for the construction of a new lock, to advocating for support from the State of Michigan to reconstruct the dock wall at the Carbide Dock, with the State of Michigan approving a special legislative grant of $1 million for this purpose, uh, to advocating for legislation which would permit the names of all individuals who filed in compliance with the provisions of the Charter to be placed on the ballot, uh, which was provided for by Public Act 118 of 2017, advocating for funding from the Michigan Department of Transportation to help fund the construction of a salt shed, uh, advocating for additional revenue sharing and fire protection grant funding, and taking further actions to help advocate against short-term rental legislation which would erode local control, to advocate for legislation precluding the use of the dark store theory, uh, advocating support for Lake Superior State University, and monitoring significant legislative changes on pensions, other post-employment benefits, uh, the statewide implementation of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, and the elimination of the driver responsibility fees, which uh, are used to fund the fire protection grant uh, funds, which help to support city operations. In regards to municipal finance, during 2017, uh, the city also continued to strengthen the financial infrastructure of the city. As the commission is aware, the taxable value of the city has decreased 5.4% from uh, over the past five fiscal years, and there has been a historic reduction of over 25% in revenue sharing since fiscal year 2002. But at the same time, uh, prudent resource allocation and management has allowed the city to maintain a stable general fund minimum balance that has increased modestly from 18.5% in 2013 to at least 22% in 2017, and has helped support the city maintaining its A-plus bond rating from Standard & Poor's on its general obligation debt. 
Efforts central to those achievements include uh, the continuation of a long-term financial forecasting model, uh, the implementation of the two-year budget, the adoption of a municipal debt policy and a capital projects budget policy, continuing compliance with state reporting, the continued support of uh, the distribution of PEHP funds in conjunction with our employees, and again, with the support of our employees, continued health care cost containment efforts through the Special Health Care Determining Committee. 2017 was also a significant year in elections. Uh, the city certainly congratulates former city commissioners Lynn, Bauer, Gage, and Osterhout for their service. And welcome commissioners Baker, Collins, Talentino, and Miller. As the commission is aware, there was also a significant change in early 2017 with the changing in polling locations. Uh, in early 2017, the city received notifications from the Sioux Area Public Schools that their facilities would no longer be able to be used for polling sites, and the city worked closely with St. Joseph Church and the EDC to move polling locations. I would like to uh, express my appreciation to the clerk's office for responding with professionalism and facilitating those changes in polling locations in a very tight time frame. A bit of data about the turnout for elections, uh, just over 12% for the May election, just over 8% for the August election, and just uh, approximately almost 23% for the November election. And there are over 8,400 registered voters within the city limits. Uh, during 2017, the city welcomed a number of individuals to the city team. Uh, Eric Gordon in the clerk's office, Andrew Biederman in the fire department, Daryl Hill, Parks and Recreation, Josh Jazuski, Downtown Development, Kyla Riator as the cruise ship coordinator, Peter Windsor in the fire department, Scott Hazewinkle in the police department, and Anthony Loxanen in the police department. And also witnessed the retirement or departure of a number of employees, including Bill Anderson, former street superintendent, Jason Thorpe, former fire chief, Terry Collins in engineering, Joan Roney in community development, Tom Sherman with the fire department, and Carson Duffy with community development. And just a special note to congratulate Linda LaFord for retiring as the Sioux Housing Commission Executive Director, and to Wendy Bodwin for becoming Executive Director. Although not a direct employee of the city, uh, the Housing Commission is created under uh, an ordinance adopted by the city. And a number of transitions and promotions, with Scott Labani being appointed Fire Chief, uh, Eric Fountain being appointed Street Superintendent, Bruce Lippinen becoming the Water and Sewer Department Leader, uh, Joe Miller, Engineering Technician, Amber Petrangelo, moving to the Finest Department, Kevin Mohar, uh, promoting to Fire Captain, Andrea Kinnear to the Police Department Clerical, Andy Morrison, promoting to Fire Department Lieutenant, Natasha Dewey, Senior Parking Enforcement, Phil Shepard to Fire Department Lieutenant, Melanie McBride to Community Development, Nick Vaught to Fire Department Driver, Randy McRory to Cemetery Sextant, certainly a position which uh, requires significant uh, service to the community and making sure that um, difficult situations are handled very well. Uh, Paul Young with Fire Department Driver and Tommy Brown to the Water Department Maintenance. And again, to recognize the members of the various boards and committees of the city, uh, we're very fortunate for those people who serve on our boards and committees. And in 2017, a number of people joined uh, for either the entire year or part of the year. Danny Armstrong, uh, Margaret Bechet, Charme Wood on the Community Services Board, Steve Twardy on the Zoning Board of Appeals, Darian Nevue on the Construction Board of Appeals, Abby Baker on the Downtown Development Authority along with Allison Youngs, Steve Garish on the Existing Structure Board of Appeals, Seth Harris, Planning Commission, Ken Dunton, Jr., Zoning Board of Appeals, Joe Gallagher, Planning Commission, Sabrina Oshelsky on the Police and Fire Pension Board, Patty Olson on the Historic Structures Management Committee, Larry Campbell for the Housing Commission, uh, Ben Duff and Debbie Jones on the Downtown Development Authority, uh, Bill Lynn on the Local Officers Compensation Committee, David Lockhart on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and Jeremy Ganyu with the Existing Structure Board of Appeals, and Christine Roll for the District Library Board. And 2017 also certainly would like to recognize those individuals 
who departed or resigned from a border committee, uh, Clara James Jesse Beck and Jesse Beckett from the Community Services Board, Anthony Perry from the Planning Commission, Christina Dennison Solms with the Planning Commission, Eric Wodeski from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Johan Ingold from the Downtown Development Authority, John Allison from the Police and Fire Pension Board, Andrew Barnaby from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, both Greg Collins and Abby Baker who transitioned from the Downtown Development Authority to City Commission, of course, Marilyn Mackey with the Tax Board of Review, and Gary Dean and Jeremy Ganyu from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Also, would like to recognize the contributions to the community and City of Sault Ste. Marie uh, from Professor Jim Moody, Dr. Thomas Plager, and Dr. Lulu Kenda, who passed away in 2017. And in closing, a note on transparency and service. Uh, the City of Sault Ste. Marie maintains a steadfast commitment to transparency and citizen service. I'm uh, sometimes surprised by the questions that I get about meetings of the City Commission being open to the public. Just a reminder that all meetings are open to the public. Information about the city is contained on the website, ranging from the budget to the audit to various reports and plans. Information on the city finances and uh, also distributed that uh, information is also distributed frequently on a city Facebook page, which has been significantly expanded to offer information on meetings, events, initiatives, and resources. And the city also has a mobile app to help facilitate communication. So certainly as we aim for excellence, uh, we recognize that sometimes there are needs that are being uh, perhaps unmet and we always encourage feedback and request for information or assistance so that we can deliver the best possible service to the community. I appreciate your uh, attention during the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it was close to as long as uh, former city manager Spencer Niebel, and his was all just talking, at least we had the pictures. Um, very nice report, it's been, as, uh, as commissioners, uh, new commissioners see that it's been a very, very busy year. Um, and we expect 2018 to be as busy, if not busier. So um, great report, um, a lot of good information there that uh, certainly the commission uh, can use uh, going forward uh, if, if any presentations are needed to be made. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, that was really a nice, uh, nice gesture, uh, recognizing the people that uh, have passed away. Okay, uh, item B. Item B under status report is an update on the special meeting and goal setting session. As an update and commissioners are aware, a special meeting has been scheduled to occur on Monday, January 29th, with a meeting expected to begin at 9 a.m. and lasting through the afternoon. And the correction to the information in the agenda, uh, the meeting will be held at the Breeder Building at 2345 Meridian Street, uh, the EDC offices. And during this meeting, city commissioners will receive detailed reports and presentations from department heads, with the presentations focusing on operations, departmental structure, departmental staffing and budgets, and information regarding boards and committees under each department. Uh, it's my hope that the various presentations will provide a detailed overview of the day-to-day -day operations of the city government and further highlight common opportunities and challenges. Um, the information will also hopefully be beneficial for the city commission during goal setting and budget development processes. As an additional update, the annual goal setting exercise for the city commission has been scheduled to occur on Monday, February 12th, as is the case with the special meeting uh, scheduled for January 29th. It will begin at 9 a.m. and last through the afternoon. However, this meeting will be held in the City Commission Chambers. City Administration appreciates the members of the Commission taking the time out of their busy schedules to attend both of the meetings. We look forward to future opportunities and implementing the visions and policies adopted by the City Commission. In addition, I would also like to express my appreciation to department heads and their staff for their involvement in both of these meetings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And item number C? Item number C on this matter would request that Community Development Director Freeman update the City Commission. Evening, Kelly. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, just like this meeting, I'm happy to report that the master plan effort is nearing the finish line. Uh, we have reached the point where we have a draft that we have uh, requested public feedback on. 
Uh, it's available on the city's website, uh, Bayless Public Library, and in the Community Development Office on the second floor of City Hall. Uh, we had the first of two public open houses last week Thursday, which happened to coincide with the slipperiest night in Sault Ste. Marie in a long time. Yeah. Uh, there's another opportunity tomorrow, uh, which will be occurring here in the City Commission Chambers from 6 to 8 p.m. So hopefully uh, those who weren't able to make it out last week uh, can find the time to make it out uh, tomorrow. Uh, moving forward, uh, the comments are due back to me uh, by noon on January 25th. Uh, that evening, the Planning Commission will be considering those comments um, and how or if they may be incorporated into the plan. Um, once the Planning Commission has finished its work, it will be forwarded to the City Commission for final consideration. So depending on the comments received, that may be as soon as uh, next month. Okay, any questions of Kelly? Uh, Commissioner Baker. Can we get a hard copy of the master plan? Certainly. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? City Manager? Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And that concludes the status report section of the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. Thank you. Item number nine, matters presented by the public. Is there anyone in the audience like to make a comment at this time? Roger. <laughs> that was a great report. I learned what happened for the whole year. I learned it for half Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Item number 10, matters presented by the City Commission. And I just want to mention a couple of um, activities going on, which we won't have uh, another meeting before these activities. But again, the I-500, uh, February 3rd, um, uh, Snowmobile Parade is the uh, Thursday before the I-500, and it'll be the February 1st. We have the uh, Guinness Book of, of Records uh, that we're trying to set a, uh, a new snowmobile record uh, for the United States, or the world, I should say, for the world, and um, that is being um, coordinated by Sioux Events, so that uh, we expect somewhere between, hopefully, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, machines uh, in town for that day, and there'll be some uh, uh, locations where they'll be staging, but we'll be going down Ashman, to, as I understand it, to the uh, I-500 track that day. So any adult may uh, uh, be registered. They have to register for that because the Guinness folks are going to be here uh, to be part of that uh, celebration. So uh, we encourage people to certainly uh, get their machines running if they haven't been and um, be part of that. Um, also, uh, this past weekend on uh, Sunday, the uh, Special Olympics were up at Lake Superior State University, fifth annual, uh, in honor of, uh, in memory of Ron Lamar, who was a participant uh, for many years. And uh, certainly uh, a lot of uh, kudos to Phil Becker and his group that put that uh, together. Uh, tremendous event, 150 athletes from um, the UP and also the Northern uh, Lower Peninsula were involved in that. Um, and also on January 26th and 27th, uh, Friday, Saturday of January, the ice sculptures will be back in town again as part of the, uh, the celebrations going on for the 350th, and that's become an annual event. And uh, it's a very uh, great, great activity, so I encourage people to participate. So with that, uh, Commissioner Talentino. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mine is just an observation. I'd like to get a clarification, if I could, regarding the parking in the residential area. I realize it's winter. Things are getting very tight. Mm -hmm. I myself drive a smaller vehicle. There's been a couple situations where I could hardly get down that city street versus be it a fire truck or an ambulance in that situation. So if I could get a clarification on the proper parking in the residential area for winter months, that'd be great, please. Sure. Same manner. Thank you, Mayor. If uh, Police Chief Riley, if you would please provide an overview on the winter parking restrictions. Welcome back, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> As the Commission knows, we have a winter parking ban uh, ordinance. It applies uh, uh, within the city from December 1st through April 1st of each year. Um, it's ordinance number 24-35, if you care to look it up. I went through it today and I kind of restructured it to where it's a little easier to read because uh, I was told I'd probably be called up here for this. Uh, basically says uh, with certain exceptions being a physician, ambulance drivers, undertakers, emergency calls, <clears throat> there's no parking on any street or alley within the city 
between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. during the, from December through April. <clears throat> There's some provisions to it that alters it a, a little bit. No person shall park at any time on the odd number odd numbered address side of any street or alley from December 1st through April 1st each winter unless the prohibited side is designated for metered parking. So you have an odd number at uh, uh, address side. Uh, if there's parking meters downtown, you can park there. Um, unless that side is designated for permit parking, residents are given permits to park. Or where one side of the street is already designated as no parking. You can park on the odd side of the street if the even side of the street is designated as no parking. It, it is confusing trying to follow all of this. The subsection, which is what I just read, does not apply to, and then it lists certain streets, mainly downtown areas and all that. Uh, the subsection, and this is the odd numbered parking side, shall not be in effect between the hours of 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Sundays where parking is otherwise allowed. So if you're lar allowed to park there, this is how I'm reading it, you know, in the summertime, on Sundays you can park on the odd numbered side of the streets between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Sundays. Primarily because of churches. Probably. And, yes, that's exactly what it is. But in a residential area, it is on, there's no parking on a residential area in the wintertime on the odd numbered side of the street. Well, on any, not just residential no, right. areas. You know, the, the ordinance starts out, there's no parking on the streets between December and April. Then it goes on to make certain exceptions. Mm -hmm. So it basically applies to all streets. It's night parking, and, that, and that's so, you know, the plows, if we get a snow or something, the plows can get through at night, you know, and uh, without hitting cars or having people move their cars. Opens up the streets. And then you get into the provisions for odd numbered address sides and Sundays and everything else. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, Chief. My major concern was just during the daytime, cars on both sides. It's just, it's just too narrow. We have a lot of streets like that, and yeah. especially with the snowfall. You know, it just mm -hmm. thank makes you. it smaller. Yeah. Officers, officers are out enforcing it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, I drive around and I see the tickets, parking tickets on the windshields. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Baker. Um, I just want to touch base on a few things about the I-500. Uh, first off, I want to thank all the volunteers that year in and year out continuously do this for our community. It's, it's been a cold winter and they've been out there working hard for us. Um, so I really appreciate all the work that they do. And also I want to mention that the Youth Advisory Council from the Sioux Area High School will be hosting a uh, breakfast the day of the I-500 at Maloney's Alley uh, from 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. up until the race. It's a one walk through buffet. They'll have eggs, bacon, pancakes, the whole spread. Um, it's for $10. They're raising money to go to the Dominican this year to build houses, sustainable houses. So it's a great cause. And um, because of all the amazing volunteers from the I-500, we're offering for any volunteer from the I-500 that breakfast for $5. So um, excited to help out with the Youth Advisory Council and get them to the Dominican for some good cause. Um, definitely want to mention the Stolen Wheel Parade, as the mayor did. Please sign up. This is a huge event. We need you to pre-register with the Sioux events. They need more sleds. Um, also, um, pub crawl shirts are in for the pub crawl. That's on Thursday. They're for sale at all local downtown bars and restaurants. Uh, $10 for t-shirts, 12 for the long sleeve. That will take place on February 1st. Uh, with that said, uh, for the day of the race, the downtown businesses have teamed up with the cab companies and the DDA, and there'll be pick up and drop off points between Subway and the Frog on the corner of Maple and Ashman, and then on the corner of Spruce and Ashman as well to get picked up downtown, brought up to the track, and also at the track to be brought downtown. So please remember to be responsible, don't drink and drive, be safe. Um, we've tried to make it as easy as we can. Um, and the I-500 is my favorite event of the year, and it's the, a very good, uh, proud moment for the Sioux, because it's, again, it's 
it's our community that puts it on and all of our volunteers so very thankful to be a part of it okay thank you anyone else uh, commissioner geary i make a motion to adjourn this meeting support it's been moved supported all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. 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 Oh, same sign we are adjourned thank you very much